For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. I want to talk this morning about the first title that he gives him, the Wonderful Counselor. Because Jesus is more than just the God who gave his life for us so that we could not go to hell. Jesus is more than a, a, a good friend. He's more than a savior. He's more than just the son of God. Because in his, in his makeup, in who he is, we find all four of those. But I think the one probably, maybe, I'm not sure if Prince of Peace is, is more, uh, more pertinent today or if wonderful, wonderful Counselor is. Because a wonderful counselor can take you to the place of peace. And so a lot of times, without having the totality of Jesus in our retrospect and in our minds, then, then we rely on, on the word, or we rely on experience, or, or we rely on someone else's experience. And Jesus wants us to rely on him and to rest in him. And so when he's called Wonderful Counselor, I want us to just very briefly go back to why Isaiah might have chosen those words. Because I don't think he did so uh, without much thought. Because the time frame is about 900, 900 years, 800 years, before Jesus actually came on the scene being born of, of Mary. And so the life of a Hebrew was one of captivity. They were being rounded up by the Assyrians and were being held captive. And so as their world was kind of being um, pushed forward by an outside force, Isaiah wanted to remind the Israelites that God had promised a Messiah, that he promised them peace, he promised them eternity, he promised them might from God, but he also promised that there would be a, a gift from God who was wonderful, who was beyond comprehension, who was beyond imagination. And so he gave him the title of Wonderful Counselor. The word wonderful is used in Hebrew here is, is uh, P-A-L-A, Pala. And it indicates a phenomenon lying outside the realm of human explanation. And that which is separated from the normal course of events. So when Isaiah says wonderful counselor, he's saying not wonder like, oh, wow. No, no, it's something that is beyond anything that has ever happened before. It's beyond our human capacity to, to recognize and really distinguish exactly what God has done for us. So he's, it's more than just he's, he's just, oh, he's wonderful. No, he's awesomely wonderful. See, we have to put something before it to describe because we don't really have the words to, to portray even what that word means in our human language, in our English language. And so he's, he's beyond the, the realm, beyond the scope of us being able to, to comprehend and speak. And then he uses the word counselor. He says he's the wonderful, beyond imagination, counselor. Now, when I think of counselor, I first thing I go back to is the guidance counselor in high school, you know, that is supposed to guide you into going, picking the right college and finding yourself and all that kind of stuff, or, or you're having some, some issues and so you go to see a counselor or a therapist or a psychologist or someone along those lines. And that's not what this word means here. It's, in, its, in its historical usage, it's, it's a picture of a, the, the wise king, let's just say Solomon, and his, his tributes can't figure out life, and so they come and desire an audience with the king. And because the king is the wisest counsel, certainly in Solomon's case, they trust what he says. And for the Israelites back then, they needed all the counsel they could get. Because they, they really had spent a lot, of poor, a lot of their lives in captivity. They spent a lot of time... Um, working for someone else, living for someone else. And there seemed to be a lack of hope. And so woven within this one verse in Isaiah chapter 
9, verse 6, is the idea that, that, that the Messiah was going to be the wonderful counselor who brought hope because he was going to be the one who would steer them through life. He would be the one who would steer us through life that we could rely on to know, to understand, to not just know and understand, but comprehend all of life and be able to lead his people, lead us to a deeper relationship, a deeper, greater understanding of him and how to, how to travail this life. Because this life can be very, very overwhelming if we're not careful. It's easy to get wrapped up in all the minutia, all the news. You guys watch a lot of news? Good, don't. Not too much. I, I have to be careful because, I, I, you know, I, I, consume, I consume a lot of media and a lot of books. And, and if I'm not careful, then it begins to, to dampen my, my spirit. And it kind of kind of makes me angry. And so I have to be wise enough and intelligent enough to, to turn it off and to walk away. But, you know, that comes with our walk with Christ. Because he left us his spirit, and his spirit guides us into his truth. And so we have to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to be so immersed in outside influences that we forget the wonderful counselor is here. And for the church, when Jesus ascended and the Holy Spirit came, he came to be our counselor, to be our, our guide. And so we have living in us the Holy Spirit of God. See, Isaiah didn't have that. So Isaiah was, was still living in the promise of the coming Messiah. And so Jesus is the Messiah, the wonderful counselor. In Micah chapter 4, verse 9, Michael, Micah declares the dilemma that the captives, in, in the Jewish captives in Babylon faced. And he said it this, he says, Why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has, he, has your counselor perished? In other words, do you not have anyone who can guide you, who can lead you? And unfortunately, in the 21st century, so many Christians act and live like they have no hope, they have no leadership, and that they're left to their own accord. And so what Micah said, really, is something we, we probably need to say. Do you have no hope? Do you have no rock on which to stand? Do you have no, no, no leader, no, no savior, no messiah, no guide that can lead you into living life in a productive, God-honoring way? Because so many people that I know and that I listen to and that I watch who call themselves believers don't live like they have a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, everlasting father, or the prince of peace. They just live life by the moment. And Jesus says, you don't got to do that. Matter of fact, you shouldn't do that. You should have the purpose and plan of God. So what evidence do we have that Jesus is our wonderful counselor? That's what I really want to talk about this morning, is what can we rest on according to Scripture about what the Bible says and the New Testament and the Old Testament people experienced by trusting, waiting for, and relying on Jesus. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1.30, and that verse won't come up, he says, this is some of the evidence of Jesus. He's the one who became for us wisdom for God, from God. He is the wisdom of God. So God in his, in his sovereignty, God in his knowledge, God in his, in his plan, allowed and sent Jesus, the Son of God, to show the world, to, to show his people, to show the church that in, in him is found that wise, mighty counselor. He's, he was prepped for that. He is that. Because I, we, can't, we can't forget that Jesus came in the flesh. He was all human and he was all God. And he is all God. He will always be all God. He was always all God. But he came in the flesh as an example for us on how we can live life fully for God. And so Jesus 
in his, in his sovereignty, in his glory, laid his want, his human flesh want will, and he, he submitted it to the Father. And Jesus says, I, I will only do what the Father directs and leads me to do. I do nothing of my own accord. Do you know how hard that must have been for, for Jesus, for God, to submit to God? From a human standpoint, it's impossible. But not from a Trinity, a Father, Son, Holy Spirit mindset. That Jesus tr so trusted in himself, so trusted in the Godhead, that he said, I will come and I will be the example. I will be the price for humanity to have a relationship with God. So that's what Jesus accomplished. And in that, he proves through his life, through his ministry, through his death and through his resurrection, that he is worthy of our worship. But even more than worthy of our worship, he's worthy of, 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 our, of our sacrifice. He's worthy of our suffering. But most importantly, he's worthy of our commitment. He's worthy of of our giving him our all and all. I want to read a long passage of scripture because Jesus demonstrates throughout all of the Gospels how wonderful he truly is. And one of the ways that he shows us and really proves who he is is by meeting us right where we are. And one of the areas in, in the Gospels in the early first century was the need for healing, the need for right relationship with God, with body, with mind, with heart, with soul, and with spirit. And so in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 12, the scriptures are going to come up and I'm going to read this whole thing. I kind of toiled over whether or not to read it all. But I want to put it into perspective. There's an Old Testament perspective and a New Testament perspective in this passage of Scripture. So in verse 12, Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, that's John the Baptist, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. Okay? That's the Old Testament. That's from the Old Testament. Jesus is just, uh, Matthew is just quoting from the Old Testament. And then, from, in verse 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brothers, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and left their boat and father and followed him. Now here's the verse I want us to know. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. So large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So Jesus met his world right where they needed him most. And for most people, it was overcoming affliction. See, what Jesus teaches us through his ministry is, is that when you meet people from where to, when you meet people where they are, you can take them to where you want them to go, to where they need to be. 
And if you don't feed them, if you don't heal them, if you don't love them, then why in the world would they ever listen? He wrote, they came from all over the world, all over the, the, that portion of the world, just because Jesus was meeting the needs of those that were afflicted. And all of a sudden, his ministry kicked into high gear because he, had called, he called, began calling the disciples those 12 that would walk along with him, that he would, he would allow and would show how to do the, the work and the will of God so that they could speak truth and wisdom and, and knowledge and righteousness into the lives of those people that so desperately needed it. So Jesus met the people right where they were, and a lot of them were met in their need. You know, that's part of why we take missions offerings. That's why we do the Nicene Murphy. That's why we do the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and the Annie Armstrong Easter offering so that we can, we can financially support those that are serving and meeting the needs of people in countries whose names we can't even know or states or people groups that we're not that familiar with so that we can meet them where they are so we can reach in and we can touch them so he healed he was fulfilling what the Old Testament said was going to happen, what the prophecies that he was going to be the healing Messiah. But he's so much more than just the healing Messiah. I mean, that's, that's what opened the door. He didn't just meet them where they are. Jesus gave people a reason to hope for something better. Jesus, the wonderful counselor, came so that people could hope and no, there was hope for something more than the mundane life that they had been living. living. And again, go back to Isaiah, talking to, to the Israelites who were in captivity and captives by the Assyrians. They needed those words of hope. They needed to know that their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and all the generations that were going to follow, that they would not be stuck where they were. If you talk to a lot of, a lot of people that were raised in the, the, the early 1900s, let's say from the 1900s, certainly through the Great Depression and through World War II and, and right before the, the, the uh, Korean War time, a lot of them, their, their greatest hope for their kids were that they would be better and be better off than they were that they wouldn't have to struggle, that they wouldn't have to, ha have to, to scrunch and, and save uh, claw just to get enough to eat. And so here, I can say this from example from our grandparents. My, uh, my, my grandmother and grandfather, they went through all of that. And even when it was all over, they still had the mindset of savers. Let me just say it that way, of savers that you didn't spend more than you needed to, that, that you didn't worry about because you'd set aside just in case. And so they tried to instill that in their two daughters. One of them it took really well, the other one it didn't. But they went, came out of that whole life by wanting their kids to know that there was hope for the future. And that's what Jesus brings. He brings hope to each and every person that there is, is a better life for us. Ultimately, in eternity with him. But in the here and now, it's not about the stuff. It's about the person. Because he's the one that guides us and leads us into his truth. And his message was different. The message of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, was about following the rules and, and pleasing God by off offerings, by sacrifices. And Jesus came to be the offering, to be the sacrifice, so that when the Father looks at his creation after Jesus uh, fulfills his role, that, they, that he sees, when he looks at us, he sees Jesus in us. Because his blood washes away all of our sin, all of our stain. And even though we're left in the flesh, God 
is not at enmity. He's not at odds with us because Jesus paid for me to have a relationship with him, for you to have a relationship with him. And folks, there's a lot of hope in that. That means we're no longer guilty. And yes, we're going to fall short of his glory. We're going to sin. But he granted us the capacity to repent. That's why Jesus, when he came, he came and, and said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That there is a way to turn from the life you're living, to turn to the right way of life through the right person. And it's not about just being good because you can never be good enough. And so Jesus came to show us that he would meet us where we are. And then he began to, to exemplify that. He lived this, the, the perfect sinless life. Do you know that? I think we all, we all knew that. He lived the per sinless perfect life. Hebrews 4.15 says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15, without sin, he sympathizes. He knows exactly what we're going through because he's gone through life having to, to deal with the temptation, the pressures of sin. And yet he didn't sin. So how can we trust this Jesus? How, how can the world trust this Jesus? Well, in the first century when Jesus was born and Jesus' ministry began, everything that he said to the known world was foreign. Not in a language, but the ideas and the ideologies were foreign because they were raised in the sacrificial system. That you brought the lambs, you brought the doves, you brought the grain, you brought the wine, and, and you, you brought your sacrifice. And Jesus was coming and, and informing the world, I'm the sacrifice. And so one of the ways that, that, that God paved the way for Jesus was that Jesus taught with authority. Because if Jesus didn't know what he was talking about, and he didn't have the capacity to stand behind what he was claiming, then he was of no good to anyone. And so Jesus taught with authority. Matthew 7 finds Jesus teaching about several different things. I'm just going to list some of them. He, he taught about judging others. He taught about prayer, prayer and the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That there are two gates. There, there's a narrow one and there's, there's a wide one. You have to choose which one you're going through. Um, that as you live your life, you produce fruit. Is it going to be good, healthy fruit that is God-honoring? Or is it going to be bad fruit which dishonors God? About two foundations that you can plant yourself on the sand and, and, and every time a new tide comes in, it washes away your stronghold. Or you can build your life on, on a solid foundation on the rock and, and when the tides come, when the hurricane life come, you'll be able to stand because you're standing on the solid rock Jesus is that solid rock. And so that's what he's teaching in Matthew chapter 7. And then in verses 28 and 29, when Je Jesus was teaching this, and when he finished teaching this, this is what was said. When verse 28, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority, not as the scribes, or not as the teachers, not as the wisest people of the time. Jesus taught with authority. And people were drawn to him because he healed. Because he, he exemplified what it meant to live a righteous life. And then he also exemplified being so knowledgeable, so, so wise, so, 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 so complete. Because he was an authority. And they saw that he, when he spoke, things happened. And when he taught, he taught truth, even if they didn't understand because they'd never heard that before. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you? That's a foreign concept. If someone slaps you, punch them right back. And he said, no, he said, that's not the right. He said, if they slap you on your left cheek, 
turn your right cheek and let him slap you on your right. What? What kind of teacher is this? And yet they believed. Because he spoke with such passion, such compassion, because he was in authority over the words that were spoken and the reality of the time. Just like he is now. He is an authority over us. So we don't have a high priest who, who doesn't know what we're going through. It's just the opposite. He knows what you're going through, and he's willing to meet you right where you are. Whether you're a believer or a non-believer. If you're a non-believer, he will meet you at the point where you'll give your life to him. And if you're a believer, he's already met you there. So why don't you let him meet you where you are today? With any doubt, with any fear, with any hurt, allow him to be the balm that soothes and heals. Because that's what he wants. And so Jesus showed us and demonstrated life by living the perfect sinless life. But that cost him his life. Because Jesus would die on the cross for our sins. An agonizing death. And yet, through all of that, three days after he was he was pronounced dead, if you will. He arose from the grave. In Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 6. Let me just read this really quick. When the Sabbath, Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Because he was dead, they were going to anoint his dead body. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from, for us from, from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And in verse 6, And he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, there, here is the place where they have laid him. He's not there. He defeated death. He defeated all that he needed to defeat to be the conqueror, the king, the mighty father, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the wonderful counselor. Jesus did it all and he accomplished it all through his life, death, burial, and ultimate resurrection and then the ascension. He is worth everything. And Jesus knows, let me just reiterate this, he knows what you need. He knows who you are. In John, I was reading, and I, I, I like, one of, one of my favorite sections of, of, of the Gospels is when Jesus calls his disciples. I mean, I, I reference that quite often. You know, Peter and, and, and Andrew are just fishing, and he says, follow me, um, Andrew and uh, his brother, are, John and Andrew, are just, uh, you know, mending their nets with their daddy. And, and Jesus walks by and he says, follow me. But here's one, and it's in John chapter 1, verses uh, 47 and 48. He's going to call two other guys. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in, who, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. How do you know me? I saw you. Jesus sees us. He knows us. Even when he was in the flesh, he saw beyond what anyone else could see. And when he called out his disciples, when he called those into a, a relationship with him, he does it with clear, full vision of who you are, what you've done, and who you can be, who we can all be. And so he calls us out of the darkness into the light so that he could teach us, teach us some wonderful things, things that, again, are foreign to the normal way of life. He said, you know, the world teaches that you can hate who you want to, but I'm telling you to love your enemies. 
Love those that hurt you, that persecute you. Rejoice in the midst of trials and circumstances. Rejoice when you're hurting. Don't worry about earthly things. Don't worry about tomorrow. I know every hair that is on your head. I know exactly what you need. So don't worry about today. Don't worry about tomorrow. He knows it all. He's the wise, wonderful counselor. The Prince of Peace, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and he loves you, and he loves me, and he died for you, and he died for me, and nothing can separate us from his love. I want to finish with this. Romans 8, verses 38 and 39 says, For I am sure, this is Paul writing, For I am sure that neither life, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He's got you. He's got me. He's got the whole world in his hands. And he says, come on. Just like he said to, to, to his disciples walking by the Sea of Galilee, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Did you know you can't follow someone going in this direction if you're going in this direction unless you turn around to follow? We all knew that, right? That's pretty basic. If someone's traveling east, you can't be traveling west and bypass them and follow them, right? So if you want to go to Utah and you're going to Denver, you got to turn around. If you're going to Denver and want to go to Utah, you got to turn around. Why you would, I'd never, I don't know. But, but you, you'd have to. So that's what Jesus is saying this morning. If you're not a believer, stop. Because that's what we have to do. If not, then we do an illegal U-turn in the middle of the interstate, and we're going down the wrong way if you're on I-70. So you've got you, you to get to the right turn off. You've got to stop. You've got to turn and turn around. So we've got to stop what we're doing, and then we've got to turn, and we've got to follow him. Because if not, then fear runs away with us. Doubt runs away with us. Trepidation runs away with us. And we allow the cares and the burdens of this real life to crush us. But Jesus says, when you follow me, life will be as life should be. So that really is the plea for this morning. He says, follow me. He told the disciples, I'll make you fishers of men. That's part of what that video was about, the living stone, was that even in the midst of, of COVID, in the midst of, of being a church plant, they were striving and thriving to do something that would honor God. We all get to make that choice, to live for him or to live for self. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the prince of peace. And he's got you. He loves you. He died for you so that you could know him. Will you stand with me? I'd like to pray for us. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for your word, for the example that you leave us in Scripture, for the picture that you paint with words about how awesome you are how complete you are. And Father, this morning I pray that, that as your word says, all who are weary and heavy laden or filled with the pressures, that they would come to you, that they would lay their burdens, they would lay life at your feet, knowing that you will scoop them up and that you will carry them and that you'll never forsake them You'll never forsake us. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your people. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. You know, if you'd like to chat, I will be here after the service. I've got a couple phone numbers you could dial. They're all everywhere. You can know it. You can message me. You can Facebook message me. You can, 
if you'd like to talk to someone, let, let me chat with you. Let me talk with you. And there's others that would love to talk with you as well. So let us minister to you in the name of Jesus. Let's sing Jesus Lord to me, and then we're going to go home. Father, thank you for yet another day to come as a church family, both in person and online, to worship you and to, to, to celebrate your presence among us. As we go out this week, let us not wait till Thursday to be thankful, but be thankful every day for the role you play in our lives and why you were sent uh, to be that special counselor for us. And may we exhibit that, that joy, that faith, that walk to all we might come in contact this week. In your name we pray. Amen.